try this again. We just tried uh, going live with Davis Carr from Meridian Tarot for today's sanctuary chat. Uh, and then Instagram decided to not let us. So we're going to see if uh, starting a new video will let us join so that then Davis and I can chat with you all. Davis is an astrologer. Yay! Ta-da! We oh. made it. Yeah. Yay. Hello, my darling. Hello. It is so lovely to see you today. Oh, you look super cute. Oh, thank you. I put on makeup for you. <laughs> Channeling my empress energy. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm very excited for our chat today. Um, so uh, I guess, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll kind of get into your definition of sanctuary. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. It's so lovely to be here with you on this Sunday morning slash afternoon. Mm -hmm. As Ash was saying in our first live, I am an astrologer and tarot reader and the co-creator of the Hollow Valley Tarot, uh, which I have right here, of course, the, the guidebook that I wrote um, for our collaboration. They wrote a whole um, I write a whole damn book. It is hefty. So it is definitely, it's a beast, but uh, it's so lovely. Um, and in fact, uh, when I was thinking about sanctuary, of course, like tarot is such a huge part of how I create sanctuary for myself. Um, and I was even thinking about the fours in the tarot. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about that uh, once we get into it. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, but other than being a writer and a tarot reader, um, I also, uh, together with Erin, run the Hollow Valley Coven, which is an online membership where creatives and witchy folks, solo, pra solo practitioners who don't really have any other community, um, especially a community of like-minded peers, uh, can get together and do magic and we write zodiac season workshops and like so much good stuff happens in the coven uh, and I'm also an astrologer so that's sort of the other hat that I wear is I work with clients doing natal chart readings uh, and I do a lot of timing stuff too so we I, I get together with people like Ash like once or twice a year and we chat about everything that is happening in their lives and what will come to pass <laughs> The time is what it is. I like <laughs> the astrology alongside like a career tarot pull and then also a personal tarot pull so that I can kind of like pull everything together. But the number of times that like in our uh, in our signal chat, we're in a group of uh, biz witches and a little a little biz witch coven. Uh, and the number of times that I'm like, Davis, I'm having all these feels. Is this normal? <laughs> and Davis is like, so this is happening for you today. I'm like, okay, great. I can blame. That's exactly what like being my friend is like, basically. It's like anytime somebody's like, oh, this thing is happening. I'm just like, let me take a quick look, see, see what's going on. Like, oh, of course. Yes. Saturn is squaring your Mars, obviously. Like my favorite part is that like, you're always like, this is what's happening. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means, but you're telling me that it means this. So I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Exactly. College of astrology just like blows my brain all the time. Um, so what, uh, I, I, first I want to kind of dig into that a little bit before we dig into sanctuary. Um, but what, uh, what kind of got you into astrology and, and especially now, like, I mean, you've been doing tarot for many years, but now like the combination of the two has become quite specifically entwined um, mm -hmm. and that your those two practices kind of like came about and at what point have did they intertwine and and how they so astrology and tarot have always been intertwined for me I actually got into them at exactly the same time uh, so, and it, I just started offering tarot readings a lot earlier because for me, I felt like it was easier for me to get to a level of competence with tarot where I felt comfortable holding that space. And in fact, the reason why I started reading tarot is I felt like I had reached 
a limit in my own understanding of the cards and in my practice uh, in just reading for myself. Um, and I think other tarot readers like have experienced this and maybe people who are watching who don't feel like would consider themselves professional tarot readers. Like, I think you'll get there too, where you sort of come to this like limit where you're like, well, I can only see what's going on inside my own head. Like I can't escape my projections onto these cards. Totally. Right? Like, I, so I sometimes read, I don't read frequently for others, but there's a few friends that I will read for. And it's really interesting also just to see like how the relationship with different cards shifts depending on who it is that is being pulled for because also for me like my tarot cards are very much a tool that I use to speak with my guides and so like kind of being like okay well if we're talking to either different guides or they're speaking to somebody who is not me like what you know how that kind of shifts what the cards have to say yeah exactly like that context is really really important um, so yeah, all that is to say, like, I started, I discovered tarot and astrology at exactly the same time. Um, for me, like, fine, like coming into these modalities, uh, happened because I made a friend at a new workplace who was this very like cool, witchy, progressive, like socially justice oriented person. And she was the first human I'd ever met who had a tarot deck. And I was like, oh my God, this this is a thing. Like I can just go out and buy one. And of course, like the deck she had was super queer and super cool and was from this like small press in Montreal. And so I was like, well, I obviously need to get myself a copy of this deck. Yeah. And around the same time, Chani Nicholas was really coming up in, you know, the Instagram and internet culture land. Mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely rode the wave of witchy stuff becoming much more trendy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's lots of people who were doing the hard work before, uh, like, you know, 2015 or whatever. But I, like, got, became aware of it when it became popular. Uh, and so getting that my first tarot deck aligned with me discovering Chani Nicholas's work. And I decided like, I decided to get one of her new moon workshops. Cause I was like, Oh, okay. This is like witchy and cool. And, and Chani Nicholas has such an amazing way of speaking about astrology and like centering it in social justice and activism. And so I was like, Oh, this isn't just like rich white ladies meditating on a hilltop somewhere, which was like or my impression between these hours and these hours and you're like what the fuck does this even like why <laughs> yeah exactly so like I felt oh hello Willow uh I'm really lucky that I was able to find early on some like really great mentors or and role models and and people that like I felt connected to in terms of our values and our politics mm -hmm. uh because for me the spiritual is political because the world is political and you know the people who don't like to talk about politics usually have a lot of privilege and don't have to so that is not anything I am interested in being a part of um so yeah I started with Channing Nicholas's uh, new moon workshops and I you know learned looked at my birth chart for the first time pretty much like you know previously I'd like done like a google search and put in my birth time but like nothing I found made any sense to me right. um and so you know doing those new moon workshops and watching them and just sort of picking up the language of astrology almost like I had gone to a foreign country and was just like listening into conversations. Yes, it's an entirely different language, which is part of where, like, I remember the first time that we did a reading and like more than half of the, what we were talking about, I was like, I don't actually know what these things mean yet. And I just, like, I trusted you for good reason. And and like, you know, you broke it down in a way where it was like, this is what's happening. And then you explained what that meant. But the portion where you're like, this is what's happening. I was like, I don't even know. Yeah, it's gobbledygook. Like, <laughs> you're just saying nouns at me, basically. <laughs> like, what does any of this stuff mean? Yeah. And then the following year when we did one, I was like, oh, I understand more of this, but still like mm -hmm. near 
the the level of even just like basic vocabulary understanding that you have. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a really big part of my approach and technique as a reader. And I do this in my tarot readings as well. Like, it really matters to me to explain the why behind the conclusions I'm coming to. And that's something that really annoys me. And like, when I hear readings from other people or like, listen to other people's work is they just give you the conclusion without showing you the process. And I understand why that's like more accessible for people because it is a lot of jargon, but I, there is a reason, there is a structure, there is a logic. And so like when I'm doing a tarot reading for someone and they pull the four of cups, I'm going to explain like four means boundaries and structures and limits and cups means emotions and you know relate whatever like keywords i'm using like and then we bring it together well and it's part of what i love about your guidebook for the hollow valley because like i've been mm -hmm. reading for years now my dad gave me his deck um and then i've been reading for myself for like probably more than 10 years on and off and um i despite that, I never really understood individual cards and what like the nuances of them were until I was doing my swatching the tarot project where I was mm -hmm. diving into each individual card um, for stop licking your leg, please. It's annoying. <laughs> and I just hear this like slurping at the side of my head. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and but I've only done the major arcana because each individual swatch takes a shit ton of time. And so, and like, it's a natural dye study. Like it's, it's a very large project. Mm -hmm. Part of why I'm enjoying doing it. But as a result of that, you know, the majority of the tarot, I haven't gone individually card by card into. And so if there are cards that I'm pulling on a regular basis, I kind of build a relationship with those specific cards. But understanding the like, the way that not only the suits but also the the numbers and um court cards of the suits actually play into things uh, that like in to, to you know be able to pull a four or to be able to pull a knight or a page and know okay well that's what that is and then when we apply it with what the suit means then this is how we're pulling it together and your guidebook is the first one that I have found where it actually explains those things. And so I don't need to have like a one by one memorizing each of the cards to really understand and grow my, my own tarot knowledge at a quicker pace with application actually happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's, that's how my brain works is like breaking things down into their component parts. And that's when I'm doing a reading like that is just what I did, even to remind myself and to explain that to the client. So when we were writing the guidebook, and I was coming up with like the structure and how everything fit together. Uh, that was the easiest way for me to do it. Um, and I actually wrote each of the card descriptions, the first draft of them, I did it by number and not by suit. Um, and, you know, in the final layout, we have them organized by suit. But when I was actually going through them, I did all of the aces and then all of the twos and all of the threes, um, which was a really important part of that process. Cool. So you were talking earlier about how the four, the, the fours are very much what you think of when you're thinking of sanctuary. So mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so in general, like when I was, when you gave me the prompt, like what does sanctuary mean for you? The first thing that came to mind was a place of safety and security where I could be in my own energy uh, and this feeling of retreat. Um, mm -hmm. I am someone who definitely picks up on other people's emotions and often like project my own uh, need to be okay onto whether like other people are okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we're, we're working on it. Um, but I find that having a, a, 
place that is just my own, where I don't need to be on, where I'm not performing for someone, that is really important to my self-care and my nervous system regulation and just like getting all of that stuff off of me. Um, (laughs) And so when I was thinking about, you know, what sanctuary meant for me and how that relates to things like tarot and astrology, the fours came to mind because the fours really are that place of sanctuary and uh, like withdrawal in a very meaningful and intentional way. Um, So I'm just flipping to where I describe it in the guidebook because our guidebook has like descriptions of all of the suits and the numbers and all that good stuff. I also, I just generally love a good guidebook with a deck. Like I, there's this like concept or I I think perception that you need to, to be like a real tarot reader, whether you're just doing it for yourself or you're doing it for others that you have to like memorize every single card and know exactly what it means. And it's this very rigid Mm -hmm. thought. And I feel like I, what I really appreciate about a good guidebook is like, A, it takes that pressure off, but B, it's a good way for me to remind myself where if I haven't pulled a card in a chunk of time and I'm being re reinvited into its energy that I get to be reminded. And, and as I'm reading, I pick up different things, right? Like depending on what you are reading for, you're going to have slightly different applications to what the general idea of it is for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I use the guidebook in my own readings all the time now. (laughs) Like, I can't, like, at first I felt kind of embarrassed about it. Um, uh, Sorry, my cat just walked into the office. Uh, Hello, Luna. Um, But we're pet sitting for a friend uh, whose Luna is a terror um, and will attack. So I just need to... uh... I also love that you're like pet sitting and it's like, okay, we need to protect the other pet from Luna. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. She's so annoying. Sorry. (laughs) My door doesn't close properly either. This is very embarrassing. Here we go. Like every time Willow decides to like shove her head and knock things over. Yeah. Pet emergencies. There we go. Willow, make a loud noise so that we're on even footing. She's in a second. She's currently lying with her head like on top because she's mad at me yeah all right anyway as I was saying yes I use my guidebook for myself all the time uh especially like reading for myself like when I'm showing up for a client like that's my job I'm on it I do my work beforehand I am like clear and dropped in and I'm like ready to be a channel and when I am just reading for myself like I'm too close to the situation. Like there's so much at stake for me that it really helps to have the guidebook there because it helps to bring a little bit more objectivity. That so that's mm-hmm. yeah. so like usually what I'll do is like I'll pull my cards and then I'll look through a guidebook and pull out some key words, key phrases that like feel meaningful uh, to the situation. Mm-hmm. And then I'll do like, a deep dive. Okay, here's my thoughts and my feelings and my journaling and all of that. Um, So that's how I read for myself these days. Um, Here's, here's Oliver, the poor kitten. He's just trying to be okay. Or is like the coloring of his fur makes it look like his eyes are like really far set on his face. (laughs) He's a real sweetie. Okay, so the fours. The four, this is my description of the fours in the Hollow Valley Tarot. Security, stability, boundaries. In the fours, you take what we've created in the three and start to organize it. It becomes your new foundation. You bring the generative energy of the threes into balance so that you can grow on top of it. The structure of the four can keep you safe, but it can also keep you small. Mm, oh, that's a good one. How do you find that people, uh, there's like many things that now my brain is firing into multiple directions of what I want to talk about. But how do you find because I feel like the in the same way that people have kind of like preconceived notions of what 
some of the cards in the major arcana mean in terms of being like good or bad, like this very binary thinking. I feel like that can be said with some of the with some of the numbers in the mind. Mm -hmm. So how do you notice that there is kind of a trend to how people react when a four comes up? <sighs> I do feel like fours are subtly tricky for folks. You know, a five is like a scary card, right? Like of the fives as I was asking that question. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, like we're used to kind of being afraid of the fives or like relieved to see a six or something like that. But I definitely find when fours come up in readings, it's always so subtle. Like what is going on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like it's a lot more internal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I can, when I'm like do, bringing that stuff up in a reading, it can be, it takes the, the querent a little bit of time to kind of like warm up and open up and really like settle into that energy. Um, because the, the four really reminds me of like, nocturnal earth energy so like m a little bit more passive a little bit more subtle a little bit more about receiving than like acting and breaking whereas the fives are like pointed and sharp and like breaking down and breaking through uh mm -hmm. yeah it's funny because like i mean i definitely we we know my level of patience which is often none <laughs> uh, and so, I, like, as much as I dislike those very active, kind of pointy, like, crunchy cards, there's, like, because of the level of activity within them, they feel like something that is easier for me to deal with. Whereas so much of this year, which we knew in advance because we did my readings, but so much of this year is this, like, crunchy, slow, like, just wait it out there's gonna be things happening but like you're gonna have to just work through the crunchy bits in the meantime and i have like the number of times this year that i pulled out my tarot deck to be like are we at least on the way like i feel like i am just sitting in a pool of stagnant water is it moving a little bit and my cards are like yeah it's moving just like you just gotta keep waiting and i'm like fuck but okay thank you like come on just uh, the hanged man over and over and over again oh god and reversed and yeah it's, yeah um but so yeah it's interesting though that that for the fours because i think the interesting thing for me and why i read reversals as well because i know a number of queer readers in particular who choose not to read reversals and for me I like to read reversals because I find it's the shadow side of a card. Uh, and so it's that thing of like, are you stuck in something or is there something that you're not quite learning? Like this isn't, you're not moving quickly through this particular experience. You're, you're, there's something that still needs to be integrated as far as lessons or application or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I find it really interesting that the fours can be both sanctuary and also the thing that keeps you small, especially because like this idea of sanctuary can keep us small, like boundaries are great. And we do need to be like, it, it is a loving action to maintain our boundaries, but we also have to be actively questioning and and interrogating our boundaries as well because what worked in the past may not work in the future like i think of extreme examples like you know my grandma and her uh lack of trust in other humans kept her safe during the world war ii and then kept her very isolated as an older woman when she immigrated here and had been in canada for decades and was like safe but like she she had never let down those guards mm -hmm. you know those those applications of what worked in extreme situations doesn't continue to work in the same kind of a way um and and questioning those things so i find it really interesting to think of the fours 
as being that thing that can create those boundaries that can create a safe space for you to have that sanctuary, but then also that we have to stay active with it and be aware of when, uh, when are those boundaries or when are those circles in as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been thinking about this in terms of like work and career and business stuff of like, when, when is it okay for you to try to stretch your comfort zone and like step a little bit outside of it so that you can grow and like taking that risk to do something that's a little like putting yourself out there and taking on more authority than necessarily you feel comfortable with. But if you keep doing the same actions, then you're not going to get different results. So like, how do you, yeah, resource yourself so that you feel comfortable going out into the world? And that I think is like what a sanctuary is really for, right? Like creating the space where you can be in your own energy, where you can find a lot of comfort and resourcefulness and like refill that cup so that you can then go out there and spend that energy and try new things and like get, you know, get a little dangerous, get a little risky, but then have that place that you can come back to and feel safe. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I really love the idea of it be like sanctuary being the space where you get to be well resourced and where you basically come and replenish your cup. And I think like that's, I mean, that's very specifically the way that I imagine sanctuary. And it's also why for me, it's so empress related where it's like, you're coming and you're, you're literally filling your cup with tangible resources of rest and like good food and nourishment and like feeling joy and, and having sources of joy around you. So that regardless of what is happening outside and regardless of what a dumpster fire it is, in the wider world and or within your own personal life that you are cultivating a space that is both emotional and also physical, because I think it's important to have both. Um, we've been having some interesting conversations about how like the sanctuary is, is very emotional and mental and that you carry it with you and that the physical manifestation of it is important but also is able to shift and change and mm -hmm. become not a sanctuary and then but then you can regain it as sanctuary and so we carry it in ourselves but then to also manifest it physically around us uh, as being an important an important thing to to then be able to navigate all of the dumpster fire portions yeah, exactly. Like bringing, yeah, having that personal integrity or like comfort inside of yourself and feeling like you are aligned so that you can navigate the hellscape that is our world right now. And our world always potentially like, yeah, I mean, and, and previously and like, you know, forever. Yeah. You're like, yeah, humans are questionable creatures. <laughs> so what, uh, like, what is it about tarot that for you has really allowed you to embody sanctuary or allows you to recreate sanctuary when you lose it? Mm. Oh, I love that question. <sighs> you know, tarot is one of my main ways that I connect to the divine to spirit to my guides ancestors I don't I still don't have like the right words for exactly like what I am connecting to um higher self maybe um it is it's the way that I like the at the ritual of sitting down and touching the cards and shuffling them it that in itself is an act of creating sanctuary for me um, and the, the tangibility of doing a tarot reading and holding the cards has always been really important to my process. Like, I will hold the cards to my chest, I will kiss them, I will put them on my forehead and my body, like, I will 
if I'm like really connecting with a car or a deck, then I'll like literally like put it in my bra and just like walk around the house with it or like in the waistband of my pants. Like there's very much this tangible thing that comes through with it. Um, and that's how I build relationships. So, you know, the act of shuffling is very soothing and it helps to get me into that zone. Um, and you know, the, the thing that really brought me to tarot and sort of took me from being like a casual enthusiast to a like, okay, I am learning the cards, I am doing readings, like this is becoming my thing, was that I was on a family vacation. Uh, I was with on a trip with my mom, my brother, my sister-in-law, and their eight-month-old baby uh, to visit my grandmother in Geneva, who lives in a one-bedroom flat in a retirement home. So it was like close quarters. <laughs> and there, you know, with like a new baby, like, you know, tensions are kind of high. Um, and like, yeah, like there, there was a lot going on. There wasn't really space for me. And I was really feeling it emotionally, like not having that sanctuary to go and regulate myself in and like be away from all the different dynamics. Um, that was a really big struggle for me. And I didn't bring my tarot deck on this trip. No, I was literally just thinking to myself of like how when I travel, I have historically over the last, I mean, obviously I haven't been traveling because COVID, but like the, in the years pre-COVID and actually the trips that I have coming up later this year, part of my packing list has included my tarot deck and whether or not I pull it out, like there's lots of trips where I bring it with me. I bring the guidebook. And I don't pull it out at all. But then there's other trips where I'm like, oh, no, I need to be checking this shit. <laughs> yeah, because like, and, and that is exactly like the same for me whenever I go on a trip. Like, yeah, it, it <laughs> comes into, uh, like, yeah, as Sheila's saying, like, it, yeah, it's in my carry on. Like, I like, am not letting it out of my hands. Like, if they lose that baggage, like, I'm fucked. Yeah. So I, um, like, so in this moment, I like didn't bring the deck and I had that moment when I was packing, like, do I bring this? Do I not? And I decided I like, nope, I don't need this. Like it's, you know, superfluous. And then when I was on the trip, I just kept feeling like I need it. Like I wish I had some way of checking in and being like, what am I feeling? Yes. What is the situation? What, what do I do? Like help. Yeah. Uh, and that is basically, uh, the breakdown of all of the spreads I do for myself at their core is like, what am I feeling? Cause I don't know. I'm a Gemini moon. Like who knows what I'm feeling? Like what is sort of the most objective energy of the situation? Like, what am I going through? And then like, what is your advice? Like how, how do I manage the situation? Yeah. Um, and that is literally like how I create that space for myself when I am on trips or something is going on in my brain or I just like, you know, sometimes you just get the urge to grab your deck and do it. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest way that tarot helps me create that sanctuary is it gives me a space to reflect on what I am feeling, what situation is happening, and then it gives me some kind of advice. Uh, even if it's like the judgment card, which basically just means, you know what the problem is, you have to confront it. <laughs> it's interesting too how you like mentioned that for you, it's often that you don't know what you're feeling because with that Gemini moon, there's, you know, could go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And me, where I'm just so much fire in my chart, I find the question that I'm consistently asking my cards is what do I need right now? Because I'm just so riled and my nervous system is so like bzzz, that I literally don't know what do I have at my disposal and like what is the thing that I need to deal with in this moment and then and then if I'm asking follow-ups it's often like okay what do I need to like first it's what do I need to know like what what the fuck is actually happening right now and then what do I have at <laughs> Sheila I hear this thing and then it's like, what do I have at my disposal, like right now that I can use? And then what externally would help right now? And it's often just like reminding me that, oh, you should ask for help. But 
it's a thing that, yeah, I, I feel like tarot is, you know, whether you, because I think for quite a few folks, um, tarot is not quite so spirit related. Um, mm -hmm. And so then it's just kind of like a check in for their own, just like, you know, if your brain's kind of flip flopping a little bit. Um, but for me, it's very much like getting guidance from my guides who are <laughs> calmer than me. Uh, or if they're not calm, then they're like trying to tell me a thing in like a really not subtle way. And I need to distill it down into like language that I can understand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's what divination is for, really, is like a way to in, like get that guidance and receive the, that information in a way that is feasible to us and is broken down into patterns and types that make sense to us. Like it's a translation tool. Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So interesting, too, because when we like when we're talking about like whether whatever language you use, right? Like for me, I'm often talking about my ghosts. My ghosts are also like spirit guides for other folks. It would be ancestors I'm currently reading a book that someone just got me called trust your vibes. And I'm literally like, as I'm reading this book, I'm like, okay, where you're using the word vibes, I would use intuition. But then also for somebody who's very secular or like, if you're very religious, you're probably looking at it through the framework of whatever your religious beliefs are. If you are uh, very secular, then it's going to be like, okay, what is my intuition telling me? Or what is my, um, you know, what, like, I, I just need to get out of my own way. What, what am I actually thinking? You know, like, it's applicable across the board. Um, but for me, with, with the guides in particular, like, there's some energies where I'm like this, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but you're clearly pretty persistent and trying to tell me something. And I literally don't know what you're telling me. And there was one ghost in particular that our biz, which happened, helped me to address um, back at the beginning of COVID and it had disappeared for about 10 years and then reappeared in a really big way. And I was like, what the fuck? And, and has been also something that's been with me since childhood. And it was through using my tarot deck that I was able to determine, oh, this is just like really old ancient energy that is actually trying to help me. And it's just such old energy that is so intense. It doesn't know how to do things in a subtle way. And so the way that it's trying to talk to me is scaring the shit out of me. Mm -hmm as it just doesn't know how to be more subtle. And it was through using my tarot deck that I was able to determine, oh, okay, that's, that's what this is here for. It's actually here to help me. But I think, yeah, like having those translations and whether it's that, you know, there's, there's something that feels otherworldly that's trying to, that's maybe freaking you out and you're trying to figure out, or it's that, you know, there's maybe conflict happening in your personal life and you're so rooted in it that it's hard for you to separate yourself out from it and you just need kind of an objective view right where it's like mm -hmm. I think also if you are reading cards and not necessarily assigning spirit relating through it that if nothing else the cards are kind of that way of being like oh yeah my my instinct or my gut reaction to the situation was this but then I had all these other thoughts that piled on on top of it but now that I'm seeing the card my gut reaction was the actual thing that I'm expecting mm -hmm. well I always like to describe it as a tool for self-reflection because at the end of the day like even if you pull cards and they don't feel right and they don't feel resonant or like you do it in a very like casual non you know spiritual woo woo kind of way like the act of looking at something, interpreting it, using your own critical analysis, journaling about it, like that's not going to be bad for you. Totally. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So what is something that you think uh, is a potential like trip up for folks when they are trying to get into tarot or, you know, they're like, like what's, what's kind of a, um, a myth that you would like to dispel when it comes to tarot? Mm. Oh, okay. Well, myth to dispel is that you aren't allowed to buy yourself a tarot deck. Mm. Yeah. No, 
<laughs> buy all of the tarot decks. Go on Kickstarter. Support indie decks. Buy my deck. Like buy decks everybody um especially from independent creators because we are definitely in a golden age of of like amazing interesting nuanced and innovative tarot decks um there's so many amazing things out there um i am not allowed to buy any more tarot decks how many decks do you have but oh my god um between I pro I think I want to say around, like around 20 decks in if you include Oracle and Tarot. I really should do like a actually so it's not too bad. It's bad. Yeah, it's like borderline. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I really cause I also am very monogamous when it comes to decks. Um like I use the uh pagan other world as my main deck for like three years basically, because it cost a ton of money. Uh and I was like, I'm gonna make it all worthwhile um and then obviously I'm using the hollow valley a lot right now um so that's sort of become my main deck um so yeah like you don't need to wait for permission from somebody else you don't need to be initiated into this tradition like you can just go out and get yourself any deck that resonates with you um it also might take a couple of decks for you to find one that really connects yes yeah, I yeah. Think, like for me I so the decks that I have I have my dad's rider weight and I've never had an easy time reading it but it's one that I is still very dear to me because of the way that I received it and because it also like my dad's energy is totally attached to it yeah. uh, and but then the deck that I used for ages before I got my hollow valley is the wanderer's tarot deck and I found that one it's a feminist deck I found it so to read and it still absolutely is but it also is like the most blunt out of all of my decks and it's the one where when there's like big energy or like bigger spirits trying to talk to me um or like really big situations I always ask permission from that deck of like can we do this because mm -hmm. um, it'll be very blunt of like yes we can you don't want situation though or it'll be like no nah, you really don't want us for this one where it's like it's the big things and it's gonna be really blunt uh and and then I have the my um hollow valley oracle and I found that was kind of a good like slightly gentler like if I'm doing a daily poll then it it's gonna tell me things but in not quite as harsh of a way as the wanderers can uh, and now with my Hollow Valley tarot deck, then it's a nice kind of combo of the two where it is gentler. It's not, it's not, doesn't pull punches, um, but it doesn't smack me in the face quite so directly as the Wanderer's Tarot. So it works nicely as a daily deck where mm -hmm. if there's something bigger going on, I can also be turning to it and finding it easy to read, but it's not it doesn't have quite the same weight attached to then what I am reading, which is mm -hmm. what I find. Yeah. Um, and that just comes from time, right? Like that comes from time and experience and trying things out. You right? Like there are times where there's decks that are like, yes, you're my deck for this chunk of time. And then it can shift and it either becomes harder to read it or another deck just feels like it's the right one that you should be reading from. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, this actually, I think, is, like, a good myth-busting thing, too. But, but, like, when I first started getting into tarot, I had so much guilt over, like, using different decks, which says a lot about me and, like, where I'm coming from emotional and my baggage and all of that stuff. Um, but, like, I really, like, I was the type of person who, like, when I was a kid, I'd worry that, like, my, some of my stuffed animals felt left out because, like, I loved one more than the other. Like, that's <laughs> where I am coming from. Um, and so if other people experience, <laughs> yes, Ashla, I'm cheating on my deck. Like, that's totally how it can feel. And it definitely took uh, some time and space and like getting to know different decks to really like give myself permission to enjoy one deck and need one deck. Um, and that's not to say like I don't use other decks and sometimes I feel the calling to use different ones. Uh, but I definitely took like 
some big convos with this friend to be like, are you okay with me using a different deck? Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I want to dig into a little bit more the Kickstarter project that you did because I like, so I supported obviously your guys' deck for Kickstarter. There's another deck that I'm currently waiting on that is supposed to be shipping soon that is coming for Kickstarter. I've seen a few folks recently publishing books and the Kickstarter campaigns have been really successful. But like with the Sanctuary Hub, for example, I chose quite specifically to not use Kickstarter or Patreon because A, the fees are crazy. Um, but B, with Kickstarter, it feels very specific to covering those really big price tags, which like I might end up we'll see but once it comes down to the printing um the printing time where it's like you're putting down you know five figure deposits just to print the thing um but meanwhile like you know you were spending so much time you and Aaron in building the deck I'm in the same situation right now where I'm still very much in creation stage for sanctuary and that's why I chose to add the sanctuary hub to the creative coven community which is my membership space because there's so much work it takes so much time and it felt like a great way of basically being able to take that um, kind of ethos of Kickstarter which is to support the work and to you know get the benefits of supporting the work at an early stage which people get at this point through like an exclusive shop and then also through a whole bunch of like extra tutorials and DIY and behind the scenes and like getting to kind of go uh, come along for a longer chunk of time through the creative process. Um, but there's so much risk also inherent in running these kinds of projects. And so like your guys' Kickstarter was ridiculously successful, um, but it, it took a shit ton of work. So can you kind of like, talk about that whole experience yeah I mean yeah there's as you're saying there's pluses and minuses to doing kickstarter um we we did the kickstarter route because we wanted to get decks in people's hands pretty quickly like we were pretty much operating at using it as a pre-order yeah. uh so the decks uh we had a prototype of the deck at that point the test copies um because we wanted to like show what the deck would actually look like in the promo material um but we were still writing and like finishing up the guidebook at that point um and it was definitely a hustle to get everything done by the end of the year um so the nice thing about Kickstarter is it does have this really special energy to it. Um, and because and it's something that people understand. The concept has been around long enough. Yeah. Like, you don't have to explain what a Kickstarter is these days. Like, oh, like, I'm raising money for this thing. You get a product in the end. Like, that's, that's definitely what I'm finding right now for the Sanctuary Hub that is, I think, going to be just like ongoing. The trickiest part is it's a it's a new model where it's like I am asking you to like take that energy that you would be putting into Patreon or into Kickstarter and and putting it instead into this space that I've already created beforehand. You get then the benefits of all of these extra things as well because the community was there in beforehand, but it is a new kind of way of doing it. And so it doesn't have that same connection in somebody's brain of, oh, Kickstarter is what we use to support these kinds of creative projects. Yeah, exactly. And so like the, the, the messaging around it is a lot more straightforward and the call to action is really straightforward. The downside, of course, is that it, there is a 10% fee. Oh, uh, that's huge. Yes, it's really huge. Wow. Jesus. Yeah, it's it's shitty. Uh, and then if you want to do like add-ons or, um, you know, export the mailing addresses in a feasible way, you need to use something like backer kit, which is an additional fee on top of what you are charging. Um, and then of course, <laughs> part, pardon me. I didn't hear that. That route because like, 
like I think that's one thing that people don't necessarily understand and maybe they think about it if they like donate to say like Oxfam or something where it's like this much of your dollar actually goes to the on the ground work this much of your dollar is going to all of these like the admin costs and the you know, marketing costs and the da, da 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 like the to understand that if they give you say ten dollars you're maybe only receiving five dollars and sixty cents yeah exactly that's exactly right um and you know, the, the prices of the Kickstarter decks are lower because you are sort of participating and like part of the deal is like once you get at a certain scale, then it's we can buy more decks and like all of this stuff. Um, but yeah, things like backer kit, um, which allow you to provide tracking for people and give you an easier way for people to get add ons after the fact and you know, a yeah. lot of like other the, the thing about Kickstarter is that it used to be really for like completely independent people and it still is used that way but it also has been professionalized mm -hmm. and in general things I've discovered in the product business as Ash you are painfully aware yep. people have really high expectations when it comes to their shipping times and their shipping experience like we literally have no control i'm like especially like i would say that as canadians we feel this a lot more than others do because canada post bless them i love canada post they are unionized it is like i am they're, they're extremely effective i've never had problems with canada post like even if there's an issue dealing with their customer service has always been really good. However, it's fucking expensive and it takes a really long time. And so for folks that are say in the States where, you know, USPS is still being gutted, but like it's exponentially cheaper or in Europe where it's so much cheaper and like each individual country may or may not actually deliver your package, you know, like I don't worry about things going to Germany. I sometimes worry about things going to France. Um, but, you know, the cost of shipping something in Europe is like, okay, at, like when I lived in the UK, for example, which, you know, Brexit, whatever. But like when I lived in the UK, I would literally ship things home it would cost me maybe six pounds, which at that point was about $10 tracked would arrive within a week. And then meanwhile, the exact same address back home was trying to ship me something and it would take over three months. If it was tracked, it would just get stuck at customs for an extended period of time. And it would often cost like a hundred or more dollars depending on what was being sent. And so it's like, you know, when we're trying to give people a nice experience, we're like, okay, these are the things that we can control. And then these are the things that we really cannot. Like I, as a small business in Canada, cannot afford to offer free shipping because if I give somebody a 10% discount code and they place a $300 order, at that point, they have maybe saved enough money that it would have warranted me offering them free shipping but maybe not even at that point is it worth me offering free shipping. Like it does me a better service to offer you a solid discount at the front end and then you still pay your, for your shipping. Yeah. And what I think people often don't understand is like what you're paying in those shipping fees often does not actually cover the full cost of shipping. Fuck no, it's literally just the expense of the like stamp on your box. It does not include the box all the packaging materials it does not include the time and labor involved in packing your order mm -hmm. when you like you know your many 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 boxes that you're trying to ship out post kickstarter well and that was a big part of what like how you know Aaron, Aaron uh is like the logistics queen in our business she does all of the shipping she does all of like the purchasing and so she had 552 decks that she needed to ship out like the amount of boxes in her house during this process was insane uh so it was definitely it was a huge challenge when it came to delivering it to doing it everything about it was really really hard yeah um and that's not including the actual labor that went into creating this thing which we started in the fall of 2019 uh, and the Kickstarter went live October 20th, 2021. So 
took two years to, which is similar to like with my books, it takes two to three years from beginning work through to the point where you're now able to have a solid enough product that's like not quite at the end draft and ready to go, but it's solid enough that now you can say, okay, this is what you're going to be getting. Mm -hmm. Here's pre-orders. And then from there, we go from there. Yeah. And of course, all of the money that you make on the Kickstarter counts as income to the IRS. So then you get into the wonderful realm of small business taxes in the States, which is a whole other shit show that we will not talk about on the live, but like things to consider for folks who are doing Kickstarters uh, would recommend doing it earlier in the calendar year than later. God, no kidding. Wow. Yeah. So we'll save that for the group chat. Um, but so like, you know, there, you know, the nice thing about Kickstarter is it is this like shiny thing and you do a lot of work in those three weeks. And I had so much fun during our campaign. I really liked how we ran it. We, as you know, we did uh, 21 days of Instagram lives where we did deep dives on each and every card. And that felt like such a wonderful way to give value to people and create this like energy around the campaign and also just get to hang out with wonderful witches and collaborators and talk about tarot. Uh, so that was really fun. Um, and then, yeah, getting like, there's nothing so amazing as holding a book that you wrote in your hands. Like that's pretty fucking cool. Ugh. Um, we're like right at the point where I feel like Instagram is going to kick us off. Um, mm -hmm. I could talk to you forever. So much fun to talk about tarot and magic and astrology with you. This is amazing. So delightful, my darling. Um, so where can people find you? What would you like to direct them towards right now? Come hang out. Follow me on Instagram at Meridian Tarot. I am booking clients for July right now, uh, July and August. So come and book an astrology reading. We can do your birth chart. We can look at what planets are making you cry right now, all that fun stuff. Uh, it's probably Saturn. Um, I'm also teaching a class um, next Ju uh, July uh, 16th, so uh, just over a week from now. Um, that is all about astrology and tarot and how I melded the two in the hollow Valley. That's uh, because something we didn't have a chance to touch on today is that I have reassigned all of the astrological correspondences in the major arcana. So if you want to learn about what and why and why you yourself can create your own astrological correspondences to the tarot, you should come sign up for that. The link is in my bio. Uh, that is being hosted by the 11th House Astrology Membership. Uh, so Kira Taborn, uh, the astrology, if you are familiar, uh, that's her group. So yeah, I'm doing a guest lecture. Oh my goodness. I love it. That is delightful. Mm -hmm. So much for being here, Davis. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, you can find the Sanctuary Hub in my bio. Uh, it is my version of Kickstarter <laughs> slash Patreon. I'm combining the two and hoping that it works. Um, and uh, we're going to continue with these Sanctuary Hub chats tomorrow we are going to be talking with one of my dear ones, Gracie Boyd, who is a land-based ceramicist, dirt witch, witch of all things. Like, literally everything she touches turns to gold. Um, so <laughs> I'm very excited for that. Uh, Davis, thank you so much for being here. And everyone, thank you for watching. And if you watch the replay, uh, hopefully you are watching in time to catch Davis's super cool class coming up on the 16th. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.